Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. My second official Sunday here. I'll push this. There we go. Well, thank you. You know, one of the uh, things that we just love about ministry is the relationships, the friendships, the connections we make, and we're looking forward to many here. And I'm delighted today to have friends of ours from Reno. They were, were such a joy to our hearts while we were there. Mike and Karen Davis are with us today. It's a good sign when just a few weeks after you left, somebody's willing to see you again, you know. <laughs> but uh, just a talent. I could spend 20 minutes just talking about all their uh, qualities and talents and all that. Mike and I spent uh, nearly a year and a half working together on the board and on the search team, and we had a great time. So, so good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, I want to just mention a couple of things that are in your worship folder. Uh, my role here is to be an intentional interim. That means that I'm here for a reason, and I want to accomplish some things with you. One of them is we'd like to meet all of you. Uh, and so we'd like to get together with you personally. You don't have to come prepared. You don't have to worry about tough questions. Just going to ask you on your, your perspectives on the church, get to know you a little bit better. But to do that, we need to set up a time to do that. And so out on the welcome table, there is a schedule that looks something like this. And I have some times just for this coming week. If any of those roughly fit your life, and you would like to meet with us, you don't have to, but I promise we don't bite. Okay, um, you, don't, you don't have to feed us or anything else. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to do that at all. But uh, there's a sign-up sheet here, and we'll be doing this every week until we get through everybody that we think we can hunt down. <laughs> and so uh, if you'd like to meet with us uh, this coming week sometime, take a look at the schedule, and if there's a time that fits you, Put your name down, and we'll be offering a variety of times over the coming weeks. Then inside of your worship folder is a uh, survey. I'm going to be doing this. I'm asking you three questions over the coming weeks. And uh, today's question is, and just fill it out. Leave it back on, on the shelf, uh, the exit as you leave. But the question is this. As you think about the church, I'd like this church to not lose this. This is what I really appreciate about this church. That's what this question means. I want our church to preserve. If, if anything changes, I don't want to lose fill in the blank. So if you could do that, just leave it back. You don't have to sign your name. Just leave it uh, in the uh, foyer as you leave. And then the basis of all ministry for the Lord is prayer. And so inside of your worship folder is just a template that I've used in the past is, and just the seven days of prayer request for this ministry. And so if you'd like to tuck this in your Bible or keep it with your iPad or whatever format you use uh, to keep in front of you, just a way to re remind us of what we're about as believers and as a church. So this is a prayer guide. I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to use that regularly in the coming months as God um, does his work in our midst. And I believe in a living God who's alive and at work by his spirit in us. And he has good things in store for us. No matter how tough things have gotten at times, he's not done with us yet. Aren't you glad for that? I am. Boy, I am. <laughs> and as we said before, we said it several times, but happy Mother's Day. Moms are so essential. So essential. I was just reading a summary of some research that had been done, and one of the keys to raising kids was just a mom. The mom just seemed to have a presence. It's interesting during the football games when they interview the athletes, the guys don't say, hi, Dad, most of the time. Uh, it's usually, hi, Mom. Uh, just something about a mom. Now, I also realize Mother's Day can be painful. Sometimes it's painful because we've lost someone in our lives, and it, it, Mother's Day brings back the pain. Or maybe it's because we're not a mom, and, and there's a pain in that. Or whatever the reason might be, I, I recognize that there are a lot of mixed emotions on a day like today but if you're a mom thank you for the work you've done and for the effort you still put in uh, and if you're a grandmother keep it up if you're a great grandmother keep it up if you're a great great grandmother lord have mercy on you but uh, <laughs> and we learn a lot from our parents i learned a lot from my mom my mother is uh is uh, 92 and still can hear without a hearing aid uh, it's just amazing to me, and, uh, and my dad is also alive. They live together in an assisted living place, so I'll be calling him later today. 
But here's some things my mom taught me. Maybe you've heard these before. But my mother taught me about anticipation. That's a key trait in life, isn't it? Just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> my mother taught me to think ahead. If you don't pass your spelling test, you'll never get a good job. I don't know how those two go together, but my mother taught me to meet a challenge. Didn't your mom teach you to meet a challenge? What were you thinking? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't talk back to me. <laughs> my mother taught me logic because I said so. That's why. My mother taught me about genetics. You're just like your father. <laughs> and my mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> and on and on it goes. I'd like to talk today about a couple of women in Scripture. Not because I'm going to harangue you, women, you mothers. Relax. If you're a mom, relax. Because we're all going to be learning from these two women. But uh, these two women illustrate another conversation with Jesus. And what I'm, what I'm planning, Lord willing, is a, is a short uh, series on three conversations, confrontations that Jesus has. We looked at one last Lord's Day with Peter and Jesus. And the key there was, do you love me? If you love me, serve me. And follow me and don't worry about what happens to other people. And today we want to take a look at a, almost a parallel event with a couple of women that represent all of us, men and women alike. And then next Lord's Day, I'm going to look at another confrontation with Jesus, another meeting with Jesus. And Lord willing, we're going to launch into a short series on seven local churches that existed in the first century that Jesus personally talked to. So... Uh, I trust we'll be learning from those. But I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at the account of Martha and Mary. Now, most of you ladies are familiar with this passage because you've probably heard it before. And how many of you th think that you're a Martha? Any, any ladies here think they're a Martha? Nobody. Oh, okay, we've got one. Good. Any Marys here? <laughs> Now, yeah, let's be honest. We're, we're all Marthas, aren't we? Okay. If you're able to stand with me for the reading of God's Word, I invite you to do that as I read this passage. I'm reading from the uh, NIV 84. You can follow along in uh, whatever version you brought today. Most of them all point you to the Lord and His Word. But this is an interesting account that occurs between the parable of the Good Samaritan and the teaching on prayer that Jesus has. And there's a reason for that, I think. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, this is verse 38 of Luke 10, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, why don't you just read together what she asked Jesus. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. You might want to memorize this line, because it's really some good words to remember when you're overloaded. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Together, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And Father, teach us by your spirit, your word. I pray that all of us, men and women alike, moms and dads and kids, all of us, Lord, would learn from Martha and Mary, these two dear ladies that you called. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Two ladies. Now, let me be honest with you. I think there are far more Martha types than there are Mary types. You don't get anywhere in life, it seems, if you're a real contemplative. We don't know a lot about Mary, but Martha is that type A kind of person. And there's really nothing wrong with that at all. And, and those of us who are more type A driven, uh, that's how the world operates as well. So there's nothing wrong with either of these women. They're both good ladies. 
But let's, I'm getting ahead of myself in the story. Jesus goes to a village. It's not named, but as best we would understand, Mary and Martha lived in a little village called Bethany, which was just a little bit less than two miles out of Jerusalem. Today it's part of the suburbs of Jerusalem. And you can still visit there and see a few uh, sites. There's a, uh, supposedly the tomb of Lazarus there. I remember we walked down this narrow stone staircase to, to see this, uh, whatever it was that we saw, just a stone. But uh, Lazarus was buried there and uh, was raised by Jesus. Uh, Mary and Martha are very close to Jesus. He loved them so much. He had a good relationship with them. And he loved both of them uh, for their uniqueness. Uh, Bethany, as it was about 1899, was just this little village like this. It doesn't look a whole lot different today, but uh, it's, a, it's a suburb of Jerusalem. And at one time, I've, I've never seen this myself, but there were supposedly the ruins of the home of Mary and Martha. So I, we don't know what it originally looked like, but they lived there in this little village. Jesus stopped by from time to time. John identifies the, the uh, village for us, but Jesus is there. And he's with his disciples, and he is invited by Martha, who opened her home to him. I don't know if all 13 of them came into her house. Homes in the ancient world weren't too big, and 13 sweaty disciples would have been quite an interesting uh, meal situation, unless Martha and Mary were quite wealthy with their brother Lazarus. But the, the focus is on Jesus and the two sisters in this passage. And I'd like to leave you with a thought about what I believe this incident teaches us. And I tried to summarize it in a sentence that I'll sort of break down. And the first part of this is, I think, a lesson we learn is that we are to serve others. And we see this very clearly that Martha opened her home and she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. And one of the questions we ask about this, this incident is, who was serving Jesus? Was Martha serving Jesus? Was Mary serving Jesus? And the answer is yes, they both were. And Martha was serving Jesus in her typical way. She was good at preparing. She was type A. She knew how to, to make things happen, and she was working hard, and she was doing that to serve the Lord. Mary was serving the Lord, well, fine, by sitting at his feet. Every time you see Mary... In the gospel, she is at Jesus' feet. Three times uh, there are incidents with Mary, and there's this one where she is sitting at, by his feet, and there's another incident where she falls at his feet because Lazarus died, and then another incident where there's a meal put on. Mary, Martha is working hard preparing the meal, and, and Mary is at Jesus' feet anointing them. So she had something about sitting at his feet. And that picture of sitting at the feet was a portrait of discipleship in the first century. To sit at someone's feet meant that you were a disciple of them. It means you sat and you learned from them. Now, we just sort of gloss over that really quickly. Oh, Martha's work and Mary's sitting. But this was pretty radical because women just didn't become disciples of men. You just didn't do that. Women were not supposed to do that. What Mary was doing was showing herself to be a disciple, crossing over gender boundaries and learning from the Lord. But before we get into some of the psychodynamics of this text, let's, let's remember that we are told in Scripture to serve. We, we, we are called to service through love. Serve one another, Paul told the Galatians. We are called as believers to give ourselves in practical love to other people. Remember Peter, as we saw last week in John 21, Jesus said, do you love me? And he said, yes, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Serve, serve, serve. You see it throughout scripture. I'm so encouraged that one of the characteristics of, I think they call them the millennials, I'm not sure what the proper name is, of younger generations, they're very oriented towards wanting to take up service, to care for other people, to go to the tough places and to, to, to minister and to serve. And that is such a tremendous, tremendous trait. Matter of fact, the context here, just before this incident, Luke records how Jesus encountered a lawyer who said, what's the greatest commandment? And of course, the answer is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
and your neighbor is yourself. And so the, the expert in the law wanted to get out of the implications of loving his neighbor and said, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus tells a story. Do you remember what the story was? Good Samaritan. It'd be sort of like, if we wanted to bring the shock value into our generation, we could entitle this parable, the parable of the good terrorist. Because that's really how people took it when they heard it. A Samaritan? You've got to be kidding me. But Jesus' question at the end of chapter 10 in verse uh, 36 is, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. The one who actually served the man who had been beaten up and abandoned. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So service is built into what it means to be a follower of Christ. We've been launched to serve. Throughout the the gospel, throughout the New Testament, Paul is constantly reminding believers to serve one another. So the serving is not the issue here. Serving is not the issue. Notice, though, beginning in verse 40, what happens. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She was distracted. I like how uh, there's a uh, Greek scholar who wrote a number of years ago called Kenneth Wiest, and he translates it this way. But Martha was going around in circles, overoccupied with preparing the meal. Who can't identify with that? Whatever it is that you do in life, men and women alike, if you're going to get a job done, you can get so wrapped up in it. And she was distracted. She was pulled away by her desire to serve the Lord. Later on, Jesus says to her, you are worried and upset about many things. Distracted, worried, upset. The task became the focus of what she was doing. And she started to say, oh boy, I've got to make sure that this doesn't overcook and this doesn't undercook and I've got to make sure that this is served and these are cut in the right sizes and this is all prepared. And she was just getting in a tither I think we've all been there, distracted and worried and upset. And part of what was going on in Martha is what happens to us and what happened to Peter, as we saw last week. How come I'm doing this all by myself? I thought that we were supposed to work together on this, Mary, and here Mary is sitting, relaxing, enjoying herself with Jesus, and I've got to do this whole thing. And so it became this unfairness. You ever felt that way? You know, you know the old Pareto principle that 20% does the 80% of the value, 20% of the people do 80% of the work? And after a while, the 20% starts saying, wait a minute, how come I'm working so hard and they're working so little? And so we start comparing. We start saying, this isn't fair, and I, I think I should have some help. And so she starts stirring the pot. You ever been there? Like I say, I think most of us are Marthas. I know I have more of a Martha in me than a Mary. I, there's times I like to sit quietly, but most of the time I like to, I'm task-oriented. And there's times that it can be very much of a, a stirring of our soul that how come I'm stuck with all this work? And it's interesting that it builds up and it builds up. And notice what she does. She comes bursting in on Jesus, a weast translates that way bursting in upon jesus she assumed a stance over him as he tries to translate the greek nuance so she comes barging in and here's her guest and she says lord don't you care that's a nice way to make people feel at home isn't it welcome to my home i want you to relax enjoy yourself don't you care she she starts showing her take charge personality. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Who's listening in on this? Mary. She's sort of hoping that by triangulating, she talks to Jesus, maybe Mary will get the point and come and help her. 
tell her. Now notice, this is, this is Martha who knows that Jesus is the Messiah. She has faith in him. She loves him. She's telling the Lord what to do. Have you ever done that? Have you ever told Jesus, you know, Jesus, I've got all figured out how this situation ought to work itself. And so we, we give our instructions. Our prayer life becomes a series of instructions to Jesus on how to get things done. Because, you know, he needs, he needs help in that. Running the universe is a little bit much. And it's amazing what we can do. Have you ever walked in on, on someone you've asked to come into your home and told them what to do? Maybe we have. But Martha does that. It's interesting when Paul is writing to the Philippians, he says to them, do all things without arguing or complaining. Because evidently, some 30 years later, in the church at Philippi, there was a problem. Christians were serving one another, but they got a little burdened with it all, and they started to gripe about it. And so Paul had to say, do all things without complaining or arguing. And then when Peter writes to his circle in 1 Peter, chapter 4, he talks about a number of ways that believers are to invest themselves, and he says, show hospitality without complaint. Because it's very easy to give of ourselves but then gripe about it. Have you ever done that? Well, that's what Martha, she's just illustrating it perfectly. So wrapped up in the task, she forgets the objective. And it happens to all of us. A number of years ago, many years ago, decades ago now, uh, I was part of a uh, college, uh, Biola, where I went to Biola. I was part of a uh, singing group. Back in those days, they would send groups out to churches, represent the school, and we'd do a concert. And, and I don't know how they put me on it. But anyway, I, I sang with this group. And uh, we had gone on our spring tour where we went up the West Coast and sang in churches all the way up to Washington State and back. And so we were going to sing in chapel for the student body. And we were setting up for that uh, presentation. It was a song or two. And a friend of mine, Leroy, and I'll never, I'll never forget the impact of what he said. I've forgotten the specific words, but I'll never forget the impact on my soul. Because as we were getting ready, we were sort of bickering with each other. Uh, I think there were about six of us, seven of us on the team. And as we were setting up, we were sort of snipping and Leroy comes up to me. He was in charge of the chapel, and he says, how can you come here to sing about the Lord and treat each other this way? Ah, it, it, it really pierced deeply. And, and it happens every Sunday morning in the lives of Christians. In our haste to get ready for church, we end up snipping at each other. And so... I learned from Leroy, and I, I hope I've implemented that lesson more than once, but uh, here's how I want to continue that thought. Serve others, but with joy. And so when I'm going about serving, I need to look to the Lord for the joy to serve so I'm not one who is worried and upset and distracted about what I'm doing and all wrapped up, and I forget what the objective is, is to be a, a servant, to invest in others, and to do a good, good task for, for the Lord. Because we do all things, do everything in word and deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus. So if I'm doing this in the name of Christ, whether it's preparing dinner, whether it's mowing the lawn, whether it's washing the dishes, whether it's preparing a worship service, do it all in the name of Christ. I'm doing it for him. And so what I learned from Mary and Martha is I need to serve others, yes, but do it with joy. Watch my attitude. I'd like to say that everything we do for the Lord, we love to do it. We may show up to our small group to lead it, and we sort of, oh, do I have to do this again? I'm so tired of this. Or, it's my turn to work with the kids today. Do I have to show up and do this today? I'm on the worship team today. Do I have to, <laughs> do I have to be there today? I, I'd much rather not. And I've had times where, do I have to preach today? <laughs> you know, with joy. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve you via this opportunity opportunity of relationship serve others but but do it with joy 
Now notice what Jesus says back, and this is, these are words, uh, if you've been in many church services over the years, you've heard this over and over again. But this applies to men and women alike. It applies to any of us, whatever our personalities. Martha, Martha. Now when, in the ancient world, when someone used your name twice in a row, they were, they were getting, that was a warmth and a closeness and an intimacy. They, they were friends with you. You've heard your name used more than once, haven't you? It's usually three times. Malan, Malan, Malan. But Jesus was using it to indicate he cared about Martha. Martha was trying to serve him. But so was Mary. But notice what he says. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. He taught about worry earlier in this gospel. He taught about how the seed gets scattered by the Farmer, farmer went out to sow the seed, some fell by the wayside, was eaten by the birds, some fell on rocky soil, sprang up and then had no root and perished, and some fell on soil where a lot of weeds were, and the weeds came up along with the crop and choked it out. Well, he uses the word worries, those weeds were worries, he says sometimes the word comes into a person's life and the worries of this world choke it out. He's using the same word here. Because our worries and things that distract us and the the stuff of life that we focus on can choke out the fruitfulness of what God's trying to do in transforming us. It's a danger. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Now, there's a a textual issue, if you're familiar with all in the New Testament. There's a number of different ways that, that some scribes wrote this out. And uh, I think some of our newer translations capture it well because the point is there's a lot of stuff you can work on in getting this meal ready, but really there's only one thing that's a top priority. First things first. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. So does this mean that we never cook another meal ladies are saying yes <laughs> does this mean you don't have to go to work tomorrow your goal in life is to stay home and talk to Jesus I think another way to phrase it is maybe this way serve others with joy focused on Christ do everything you do in word or deed to the glory of God in the name of Christ that, that my relationship with Christ is always the guiding principle of what I do for him. I like Charles Wesley, I think, wrote a hymn years ago that, that put it this way, Faithful to my Lord's commands, I still would choose the better part, serve with careful Martha's hands and loving Mary's heart. What it was, was in this situation, at this moment, there's a choice to be made. And Mary wanted to be with Jesus and learn all she could from him while she could. Both of the sisters, no doubt, wanted to do this. And what Jesus, I think, is communicating to Martha is you could simplify the whole process so you don't spend so much time working, laboring over a charcoal fire, trying to get all the food ready. You can make it simple because I'm okay with that because what matters most right now in the short time that we have is that we spend some time together because I have some things I want to say to you and I want you to learn them. And you're going to grow more from what you learn from me. You're going to be fed more. Your soul will be fed because you learn from me. That's of more value than what you happen to eat that's going to be forgotten in an hour. You've got to eat. And we need Marthas who are good cooks to do that. <laughs> May their tribe increase. But we also have to prioritize at any given moment so that Christ is the focus how I live my Christian life. And Mary had chosen to be a disciple, to sit at the feet of Jesus. It's not a choice between work and meditation. It's not a choice between the contemplative life and the serving life. It's it's not either or, it's both and, but there's a time and a place for everything. Remember when Jesus was in Sychar, he had had a meeting with a woman by the well. And he told her that he was the water of life. 
And she went off to go to her village to tell them what she'd learned. And his disciples come back with their bags from McDonald's. And uh, they say, do you want to eat? And he says, you know, I have food you know nothing about. I thought, what? Has he already eaten? Did the food truck come by and we didn't know it? And, and he says, no, my food is to do the will of my father. And there are times that it's more important to do what God's called you to do at that moment than to eat. Now, I have seldom ever had that kind of a choice in my life. But the point is that Jesus wants a relationship with us. He wants us to draw close to him. And you see it throughout the scriptures. Uh, psalm 27, uh, it's a great psalm. I, I love the wording of this psalm. Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To get to know the Lord, to focus on him. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth, Paul told the Colossians. And over and over again in the scriptures, this, uh, Philippians, he, to the Philippians he said, this one thing I do, I want to know Christ. The power of his resurrection. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. I've considered all things to be lost compared to knowing him. And so at the center of my life is a relationship with Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And it's possible that someone's sitting here today and you think that being a Christian is to, you, know, you got to drag yourself out of bed on Sundays and go to church and you got to, you know, give up all the fun things in life and on and on. At the core of being a Christian is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the living Lord. And it's, it, it's from that hub that everything else flows. And there are times that we have to make a decision to forego the task for the relationship. And this, this decision usually comes every morning. I find I'm best in the morning to spend time with the Lord. But if I don't do it first off, what happens? There's always something else. You've got to check your emails. You've got to check the traffic report. You've got to see what the weather's going to be. And on and on it goes. And the next thing you know, it's 3 o'clock and you say, I didn't, I didn't spend any time in the Word and Prayer today. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. How about you? Anybody here? <laughs> but there are times that we can be in the midst of our job, in the midst of our responsibilities, and be talking to the Lord about life. And so Jesus reminds us, first things first, Jesus wants my heart as well as my hands, to use that metaphor. He wants both in our lives. And, and as you look at Scripture, that is the constant reminder that we are to be in Scripture, we're to be in prayer. Look at ch uh, chapter 11 of Luke. In Luke chapter 10, he talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan, he, and then he talks about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, and I think then... In chapter 11, he talks about what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength by prayer. He teaches the disciples to pray. And so this incident with Martha and Mary illustrates both sides of that. You love the Lord, you love your neighbor. And it's a constant balance. There's no simple formula that solves it for you. But the question is, who's at the center? Who's first? And you always start with first things first. Put the most important thing in place first and the rest will follow. So it is with our walk with the Lord. So what is most important at this moment? Let's say right now. Getting caught up on your texts? Surfing the web? Sleeping? <laughs> getting caught up on your rest? There are a lot of things that we decide are most important at the moment. What would really happen if I sat at the feet of Jesus and listened. See, that's what Mary wanted to do. She wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. She wanted to learn from him. She wanted to be shaped and formed by him. What would happen if that's what I made a priority? Well, what if I was like the builder that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, who built his house, and in building my house, I dug down to find the bedrock and built my house on the bedrock. So when the storms of life come, it wouldn't be swept away. And what would happen if a church made the lordship of Christ reflected in the fact that we're, we're listening to him 
and we want to be Christ-like, we want to be shaped by him, what would happen if a church made that a priority? Can I give you a negative example of a church that was more Martha than Mary? It's over in uh, the Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at this in a few weeks, Lord willing. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus writes a letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus, and he says this, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. What a commendable church. They were faithful, diligent, persevering, tough. They were Martha's spiritually. Wow, we need them. And that's why this church is still here after nine decades because there have been some people who have worked hard and been faithful and haven't run away from the battles and the setbacks and the challenges. But then Jesus says, as much as he appreciates that, yet I hold this against you. You haven't worked hard enough. Is that what he said? No. You have forsaken. You have left your first love. You've been busy, but you haven't taken the time to both literally as well as internally just sit at my feet and have a love relationship with me. And that's what I hope you leave on Sundays. I hope you leave a little bit more in love with Jesus. And I hope that your time in the Word, I I trust it's daily, even if it's just for a brief snatch of Scripture, that you fall more in love with Jesus. You sit at his feet and listen to him. I trust that we go to prayer because we love the Lord and we want to let him shape us and use us for his glory. Instead, we trade the major for the minor and we miss the blessing. I think Martha learned her lesson. She didn't give up serving, but she realized she had to do it with the right attitude. Serve others with joy, focused on Christ. And if we can be a congregation of believers that do that, if I can be a pastor that does that, and we're going to move ahead and see God do a great work. There was an ancient Greek philosopher named Socrates who said, beware the barrenness of a busy life. I didn't know they were busy back then, but uh, they were. But embrace the beauty of a life absorbed with Christ. I want to know him. I want to know Christ. I want to set my mind on things above. I want to abide in him, and I want him to abide in me. How about you? Do you know him? you have a relationship with him? A love relationship with Christ? That's what he's calling all of us to today. And perhaps this would be a good opportunity for us to repent of those times we've just gotten so busy doing we forgot about being with him. Father, we come to you today and we have our, our personalities, our differences. Thank you that it's not that Martha's worse off than Mary, it's just that at the time she made the secondary choice. And oh, I've done it so many times myself. But thank you that you, that you are one who is always there ready. Thank you, Father, that it's never too late to start being a Mary as well as a Martha. And I pray that we would be those who would seek the Lord, have a heart open to him, even right now, Father, we confess where we have been so distracted, so busy, trying to do the right things that we've forgotten who we're doing it for. Thank you that you welcome both our work and our hearts in Jesus' name.